In Dallin H. Oak's much quoted talk on dating versus hanging out, he said in his preliminary remarks, a message given by a general authority at a general conference is given to be heard under the influence of the Spirit of the Lord with the intended result that the listener learns from the talk and from the Spirit what he or she should do about it. No one is more aware than your speaker today that you are not in this gathering listening to a general authority at a general conference. However, I hope the same principle will apply, that something you hear in the words of the prophets and the scriptures we will consider this morning will impress upon your mind and heart something you personally should do about it. President Gordon B. Hinckley has repeatedly emphasized a harsh reality of which you are all aware. He has said, the world into which you move will be terribly competitive. You are moving into the most competitive age the world has ever known. All around you is competition. At the last General Conference, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said that our culture is obsessed with comparing and competing. This morning I would like to review with you certain principles taught in the scriptures and by living prophets that relate to comparing and competing, first in our academic and professional lives, then more generally in our personal lives. One way to deal with the academic and professional competition we face was recommended to me by my graduate advisor. He said, the most important thing you need to do is to impress the right people. I thought the gospel teaches us that we aren't supposed to do things to be seen of men, to call attention to ourselves, and aspire to the honors of men. And yet my advisor seemed to be saying that if I was going to succeed as a graduate student, that's exactly what I needed to do. Of course, there is truth in my advisor's observation. Obviously, if you don't impress the coach, you don't make the team. If you don't impress an employer, you don't get or keep the job. Many seek to impress and aspire to the honors of men by deliberately calling attention to themselves. Jesus chastised those in his time who did all their works for to be seen of men. President Boyd K. Packer said in April's General Conference, to seek after the praise of men, the scriptures caution us, is to be led carefully away from the only safe path to follow in life. And the scriptures warn us plainly what follows when we aspire to the honors of men. John recorded that in the Savior's day, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Those who love the praise of men more than the praise of God seek to please men more than God, fear to offend man more than they fear to offend God, and are more concerned with what others think of them than what God thinks. Men's commendation and contempt can both lead us from the path of safety. In contrast, Jesus, speaking of his Father, said, I do always those things that please him. This is the only safe path to follow in life. Is it possible to impress the right people without aspiring to the honors of men or seeking to draw attention to oneself? Fortunately, not long after my experience with my advisor, I had the opportunity to pose that question to Elder Russell M. Nelson in a young single adult fireside. Elder Nelson thought for a moment, then said, If you are well prepared in everything you do, in school and professionally, and do the highest quality work of which you are capable, your work will speak for itself and the right people will be impressed. Speaking in the last general conference of music in the church, but applicable almost universally, President Packer said, excellence does not call attention to itself. It does not need to. As Elder Nelson taught in a fireside long ago, and as President Packer taught in general conference, Excellence will be obvious to those who need to be impressed. I know from experience that is true. One such experience occurred three months ago with a graduate student at a professional meeting. He had worked many hours on wording, rewording, and crafting his talk to present as clearly as possible his data and conclusions. He had organized, reordered, and revised his slides to present plainly the most important information in a logical, easy-to-follow sequence. This preparation continued in his hotel room well into the night before his talk. At the end of his presentation, which was the last in that session, many scientists in the audience came to the front to greet him as he stepped down from the podium, 
to commend and congratulate him, and even offered to remain in contact regarding his future research. One woman, an official from the National Institutes of Health who administers research grants, pulled me aside from the group and said, this was tremendous. This is the way science should be done. The student in his preparation neither sought nor anticipated such praise. His goal was simply to make the best presentation and represent himself and BYU as capably as he could. To do the highest quality work of which you are capable, sufficient to impress the right people, requires compliance with President Hinckley's counsel to get all the education you can. From the perspective of a nutrition professor, a college education is like a large buffet. You pay, then serve yourself as much as you want from a wide variety of foods. If after the meal you leave hungry, feeling you haven't gotten your money's worth, it's your own fault. How many of you are getting your money's worth, are getting all the education you can at the educational and spiritual buffet that is BYU? President Hinckley also said in speaking to priesthood leaders in a worldwide leadership training meeting, I have been quoted as saying, do the best you can, but I want to emphasize that it be the very best. We are too prone to be satisfied with mediocre performance. We are capable of doing so much better. Is a young man or woman really getting all the education they can if they are satisfied with mediocre performance? President James E. Faust gave this very reassuring counsel. If you prepare to walk down the path of life, you can be rewarded beyond your dreams and expectations. But to achieve this, you must work very hard, save, be wise, and be alert. You must learn to deny yourselves a worldly gratification. Steadiness and toil will serve you better than brilliance. Thus, one key in dealing with academic and professional competition is to be well prepared to work very hard and do the very best of which you are capable, refusing to be satisfied with mediocre performance. To do so, as President Hinckley also urged, sacrifice a car, sacrifice anything that is needed to be sacrificed to qualify yourself to do the work of the world. I will mention just one other principle related to academic and professional competition. It is a sad sign of the times that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has had to organize an Office of Research Integrity whose sole purpose is to try to maintain honesty and credibility in biomedical research by combating the plagiarism and outright fabrication of data by the occasional scientist who buckles under the competitive pressure to publish or perish. In this environment, being a man or woman of integrity, rather than putting you at a competitive disadvantage among those who may be compromising standards of honesty, will work to your benefit. Here's how. At another professional meeting with a graduate student some years ago, we ran into the chair of the session in which the student had presented earlier. After a few pleasantries, this respected scientist said, you know what I like about your presentations? If it's from BYU, we know it's right and we can trust it. President John Taylor prophesied, you will see the day that Zion will be as far ahead of the outside world in everything pertaining to learning of every kind as we are today in regard to religious matters. You mark my words and write them down and see if they do not come to pass. It occurred to me that perhaps the fulfillment of President Taylor's prophecy might have as much to do with integrity and credibility as with publication and professional acclaim. As issues of integrity become more and more problematic in a cutthroat competitive society, those looking for answers will look more and more to institutions and individuals who get it right and can be trusted. Integrity is not a hindrance to your academic and professional success. It is essential to it. With respect to comparing and competing in our personal lives, Elder Holland counseled parents, try not to compare your children even if you think you are skillful at it. You may say positively that Susan is pretty and Sandra is bright, but all Susan will remember is that she isn't bright and Sandra that she isn't pretty. Praise each child individually for what that child is and help him or her escape our culture's obsession with comparing and competing and never feeling we are enough. 
It is difficult to refrain from comparing yourself to others when you know that professors, employers, and others are doing just that. However, a spirit of comparing and competing may be evidence of the sin of pride. President Ezra Taft Benson, in his classic talk on pride, said, Another major portion of this very prevalent sin of pride is enmity toward our fellow men. We are tempted daily to elevate ourselves and diminish others. Those who view their contemporaries as competitors to be beaten rather than brothers and sisters to be served often believe that others' success diminishes their own and are therefore more apt to find and point out faults of those around them. Such critics run the risk of losing friends who may wonder what the critic says to others about them. In contrast, we are commanded not only to cease to find fault with one another, but also to strengthen your brethren in all your conversations. President Benson also said, the proud make every man their adversary by pitting their intellects, opinions, works, wealth, talents, or any other worldly measuring device against others. In the words of C.S. Lewis, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition has gone, pride has gone. A person who compares and considers herself superior in some way may feel an unjustified sense of accomplishment and expertise. However, the highest score on an exam does not necessarily indicate mastery of the material. If she is satisfied with simply being better than someone else, she may, in the words of President Hinckley, be too prone to be satisfied with mediocre performance when she is capable of doing so much better. Such complacence, born of comparison, may creep into spiritual matters as well. It is tempting in a rapidly decaying world to consider ourselves righteous in comparison to what's going on around us. However, there is a danger in assessing our spirituality using such a relative measure. As this simple graph shows, the Lord's standard is high, absolute, and unchanging. The world is rapidly becoming a more wicked place. If we are content to simply be better than the world, comparing ourselves to its standards and practices instead of the Lord's, we may pride ourselves on the widening gap between us and the world, while at the same time being dangerously oblivious to the increasing distance between us and the standards of righteousness we have covenanted to keep. Discouraging comparison of our weaknesses with others' talents or of our talents with those truly gifted, as we've seen this morning, may lead to the sins of envy and ingratitude as we focus on and fret about what we don't have rather than what we have been given. Compulsive comparison can rob us of the enjoyment we might still experience in the expression of the talents we have been given and in those of others. The ability to rejoice in the successes and talents of others increases our capacity for happiness and joy as we experience those feelings each time someone we know succeeds. Preoccupation with what others are doing, how they're performing, how they're being rewarded or treated starts early in life with children often asking, how come she gets to, or why doesn't he have to? Most outgrow the terminology, but for many, the preoccupation persists. Focusing on others' talents and tasks, worrying about what rewards they may be receiving, and feeling we're in competition for that recognition, may easily distract us from our own responsibilities, inhibit the developments of our talents, and divert us from our personal missions and ministries. In the last chapter of the Gospel of John, we read of Jesus' charge to Peter as they walked along the seashore. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. The message to Peter and to us is clear. Don't concern yourself with others' assignments or performance. You worry about what I've asked you to do. While serving as a stake missionary, I had the assignment of going each Sunday to the Utah County Jail to teach a Sunday school 
lessons seated on folding chairs in the hallway under the watchful eye of surveillance cameras. The favorite Bible story of those who came to class was the parable of the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several, meaning individual, ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You know what happened to the last servant. The things the inmates liked the most about this story were that the first two servants got the same reward, and the Lord didn't compare them to one another. Among other lessons, this parable reinforces the principle that where much is given, much is expected or required, and where less is given, less may be required. To each of us, the Lord might say, as he did to Moses, I have a work for thee, my son or my daughter. Just as the Lord in the parable gave talents and set expectations for each servant individually, so also does he provide for each of us a unique blend of talents and circumstances, including formal church callings and other opportunities, individually customized to accomplish his purposes in our lives and in the lives of those we can bless. Elder Neil A. Maxwell assured us no one else is placed exactly as we are in our opportune human orbits. When the Jews faced extermination in Persia, the Jewish queen Esther's uncle Mordecai reminded her, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So might it be asked of each of you, Who knoweth whether thou art come to your particular place and circumstances with your unique blend of talents and abilities for such a time as this. The work the Lord has for us to do may not involve serving in high-profile positions in the church, sadly a source of comparison and competition to some, but that is of less significance. Speaking of our church callings, President Hinckley said, We are all in this great endeavor together. Your obligation is as serious in your sphere of responsibility as is my obligation in my sphere. No calling in this church is small or of little consequence. All of us, in the pursuit of our duty, touch the lives of others. In the first general conference to which I paid serious attention, Elder Robert L. Simpson said something that has stuck with me ever since. There are those who associate high calling in the church with guaranteed rights to the blessings of heaven. But I wish to declare without reservation that the ultimate judgment for every man will be on the simplest terms and most certainly on what each has done to bless other people in a quiet, unassuming way. Blessing other people in a quiet, unassuming way is required of all of us who have covenanted to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, to mourn with those that mourn, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort. This blessing other people in a quiet, unassuming way is part of what the Young Women's Personal Progress Manual calls my own divine mission in describing the value of individual worth. Sister Bonnie Parkin, former Relief Society General President, in her devotional talk last February, echoed the theme of my own divine mission when she said, Each of us has a personal ministry. It embraces the people who come and go across the path of our life. It extends beyond our temporary callings as presidents, counselors, secretaries, teachers, and so on. Our personal ministry is sacred and precious. 
It allows us to become an extension of the Lord's love. Our personal ministry may not bring to us the recognition and the praise of men. However, it will require the exercise of all the talents and spiritual gifts the Lord has given us, as well as those He has given us capacity to develop. Many of the more notable spiritual gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, Moroni chapter 10, Doctrine and Covenants section 46. However, those are not the only gifts. In the interests of time, this slide lists many more gifts mentioned in talks on this subject given by Elder Marvin J. Ashton and Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve. While showing and discussing this list in an institute class, one young woman asked, what's the gift to weep? Another class member hesitatingly raised her hand and said quietly, I can tell you about that. She then made reference without specific details to an extremely trying time in her life. During that time, a friend came by to offer what help she could. The class member said that after describing her difficulties to her friend, all the friend could do was put her arm around her shoulder and weep. Our class member was blessed by her friend's exercise of the gift to weep, which showed that she shared her sorrow, which made the burden a little lighter. There are many possibilities to answer Elder Oak's question about what each of us should do about today's message. We can pray with all the energy of heart to be filled with charity, which envieth not, vaunteth not itself, and seeketh not her own. We can try making it through an entire day without a single self-reference that draws attention to ourselves. We can pray, as Sister Parkins suggested, help me to be the answer to someone's prayer. Or, as Elder Henry B. Eyring urged in General Conference, please let me serve this day. We can resolve to sincerely compliment someone each day, to thank someone each day, or try to go a day without finding fault. In closing, let me suggest a scripture that helps me and I hope will help you to remember this morning's message. President Benson said, The constant and most recurring question in our minds touching every thought and deed of our lives should be, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In many cases, our interpretation of scriptural passages depends on which word or words we emphasize. If this question is read and remembered as asking, what wilt thou have me to do? It will help us to focus on God's will, His honor, His praise, and His blessings, and distinguish them from those of men. If we ask, what wilt thou have me to do? It will remind us of our uniqueness, our individual and infinite worth, our own divine mission our Heavenly Father expects us to accomplish regardless of what others perform. If we ask, what wilt thou have me to do? It will remind us to translate our good intentions and what we know into righteous action. I do not have the ability to impress upon your minds and hearts as powerfully and indelibly as I desire the glorious reality that each of you individually is of infinite worth to God, your Heavenly Father. Your value to Him is independent of your body mass index, your accomplishments in arts, academics, or athletics, your possessions, popularity, or marital status, your current calling in the Church, or any other thing which can be a source of comparison and competition. His love for you is infinite, quantitatively and qualitatively, and intimate intensely personal and specific. He knows your name, your successes and setbacks, your triumphs and defeats, your fears, your doubts, your hopes, your desires, your motivations, your thoughts, words, and actions. He feels what you feel. He shares your joys and sorrows. He desires your happiness now and forever. May you seek the praise of God and do always those things that please Him. May you cease unhealthy comparison to others and delight in your individuality and uniqueness. May you be faithful in your church assignments and in your individual personalized ministries, your own divine missions, 
using your unique blend of talents and spiritual gifts to bless other people in a quiet, unassuming way. I testify that God our Heavenly Father lives. I bear testimony that Jesus Christ is His Son and the head of this Church. I testify that the, that the mind and will of the Lord are made known to us in the words of living prophets and apostles. That includes the counsel we have considered this morning. Of these things I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.